Let's meet Molly, the world record holding baby who was frozen when her mom was only one year old. Hey friends, today we are talking about frozen embryo transfers and a top question that I get asked is, how long can my embryos be frozen? Essentially, are they going to get freezer burn? Of which I always say, no, they're not gonna get freezer burn. And this is why. I'm gonna break down an interesting case of Molly, at least to our knowledge, the world's longest frozen embryo who was transferred and became a live born baby. She was frozen for 27 years and going through her case brings up some really interesting points. Two quick housekeeping items. Number one, I'm not her doctor. I did not take care of this couple in any form or fashion. I do not know their medical case at all. This is not me spilling their medical history. I'm taking what they have talked about publicly in the media, and I'm giving you some medical facts behind it. The second thing is I'd love it if you'd subscribe to the channel. Please, please. We are growing and I'm so excited about it. This is a great way for us to help break barriers of infertility and spread more fertility awareness and education. Okay, so this is the headline. Meet Molly, the embryo who was frozen when her mom was a year old. And of course, that's kind of clickbait because that's really curious. How was she frozen when her mom was one year old? Well, let me tell you what we know. So Molly has actually beat the world record for her sister, Emma. Emma was frozen for 24 years before she was born. Now, what happened is that Molly and Emma's parents, Benjamin and Tina Gibson, they were having infertility. They actually knew they were going to have a hard time getting pregnant. I didn't see many details in the media, except that he carries cystic fibrosis. Carriers of cystic fibrosis, especially in men, they can have something called CBAVD, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. So quick anatomy review. The vas deferens helps connect the testes where sperm is made to the ejaculatory duct and the penis, the urethra, where sperm comes out. Men who carry cystic fibrosis and men who are affected with cystic fibrosis have a very high incidence of CBAVD. When you just do not have the vas deferens, you're just not born with it. So you have testes that make sperm. However, the sperm is not in the ejaculate. So the classic history is a couple who's been trying to get pregnant for years. And then they go and get a semen analysis. And the semen analysis has azoospermia, has no sperm seen. So when the male has CBAVD and there's no sperm in the ejaculate, the options for trying to get pregnant include either donor sperm or doing a procedure where you extract sperm from the testes itself or from the epididymis. Thereby, you don't need the vas deferens. But it's really expensive. You have to do IVF. So that's a very expensive process. And of course, there's a variety of factors from the female partner that may play a role. So this couple had been actually fostering kids, which is wonderful. And they had decided they were probably not going to be able to be parents or they'd be parents through fostering or adoption. What happened, part of the story, is that Tina's dad read in a paper or somewhere about what well, we called it embryo adoption. So adopting an embryo. ASRM has actually come out. So ASRM is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. They make the guidelines. They're like the governing organs for all reproductive endocrinologists and for the fertility field. And they've said really clearly, this is not to be called adoption. Adoption refers to a child that is born. There's all kinds of legal ramifications and rights that should go with this. This should be considered donation, just like we have sperm donors, egg donors, embryos that are donated. Tina's dad read about embryo adoption and told her about it. So then she and Benjamin started researching it and they decided they wanted to explore it further. And so when they started researching it, they decided to go to a place close to their home called the National Embryo Donation Center. I'm gonna come back to them because they're a little sketchy just overall. I'm not just in the process. I love anything that helps make a family. And I believe there's much more to a family than to genetics. Embryo donation solves a really good problem. There are abandoned embryos. So when you go through IVF, there's different options that can happen. You can have a fresh embryo transfer, or you can freeze your embryos. Now, when IVF was first started, that, that was not a thing. You couldn't freeze your embryos. Then embryo freezing came around. It was poor technique. The survival rate was between 50 to 75%. So not every embryo that was frozen survived. It was called slow freezing. For years, the best embryos would be transferred in a fresh transfer. Now I have a whole video on IVF and so you can go learn a little bit more about the process if you don't understand the words or you're curious, but IVF, in vitro fertilization, egg and sperm out of the body come together in the lab. You can have a fresh transfer, which means on the day of implantation would normally happen, five days later, you'd pick an embryo and put it back in the uterus. Or you can have a frozen transfer, which is where those embryos are frozen and then they're transferred in a subsequent cycle, like the next month 
or years down the road for babies two or three. Originally, in IVF, there's some confounding factors. One, we didn't have freezing techniques. Then we developed freezing techniques and they weren't very good. Also, there wasn't good culture media to keep embryos in culture very long. So current modern standard of care is to transfer embryos to the blastocyst stage. The blastocyst is day of five or six embryo. That's when an embryo is ready to go and implant in the uterus. However, when IVF was first invented, we transferred embryos to the cleavage stage, which you can see is a completely different thing. At cleavage stage, embryos are eight to 10 cells. Oh my God. Eight to 10 cells that form to a baby. It's crazy. The blastocyst stage is like 200 cells. It's already expanded into a placenta, into an inner cell mass. Blastocyst transfers survive better and have higher pregnancy rates. All freezing is essentially you want to get the water out of the embryo so there's no ice crystals in it. But the old slow freeze technique, again, 50 to 75% would even survive the process. And then your pregnancy rates would be around 20%. So even if you were doing a fresh transfer, you tended to put more embryos in. And you can see current embryo transfer guidelines differentiate on cleavage and on blastocyst embryos. Blastocyst embryos are better quality and they have higher success rates, so you should transfer less. Standard of care is one single embryo blast transfer. Cleavage stage embryos do not have the same potential and so you are permitted to transfer more based on the time period that these embryos were frozen. So what we know about this case is that Molly and Emma are sister embryos who came out of the woman's body at the exact same time. So just listen to this. A couple went through IVF. Her eggs came out of her body and were fertilized by sperm. It was that one month's group of eggs that grew to make this entire cohort of eggs. Molly and Emma were both in there. This woman got pregnant with her family or never used the embryos or something else happened. We have no idea, but however happened, they donated their embryos to NEDC. They were frozen in 1992, you guys. October 14th, 1992, to be exact. Based on that timeline alone, that was a slow freeze cleavage stage embryo. NEDC does a really interesting process. So NEDC does their own transfers. They have their own lab, they do their own transfers. So you actually pay their money, write them the check before you've picked out a donor. It blows my mind, but you pay them the money. They like do preliminary evaluations, that's all good. They do a practice embryo transfer, a fake cycle where they watch your lining grow, all of that stuff. And then, then once you're cleared, you get your embryos. Also presuming these embryos were cleavage stage embryos because they transferred three. Whoa, that makes me nervous. But we have to remember this is from a different era. This is 1992 we're talking about. And I don't know the age the woman was when the eggs came out of her body or any of that information. That differs too because the older somebody is, the more genetic abnormalities there are going to be and it's okay to transfer more. But no matter what, they transferred three. And Tina got pregnant with one baby and she had baby Emma. And so when Emma was born in November of 2017, it was headlines everywhere world's oldest baby, baby born at 24 years old. You know, these catchy headlines. She'd been frozen. And that slow freeze is not as good for 24 years. So Emma's parents were able to purchase the entire lot of leftover embryos from this couple. So they had five total embryos, two remaining embryos that they transferred earlier this year in 2020. And those embryos resulted in Molly. And so Molly had been frozen for 27 years. Isn't that crazy? She and her sister were made at the exact same time. Same day, came from the same, they grew inside those ovaries together, but now they're years apart. Weirdly intriguing is that these girls could have been like best friends with Tina. They would have been the same age or in school together had they been born closer to their freeze date. So it's super cool and fascinating. We have to remember that IVF when it first came out, people were so afraid of all these things. Designer babies and gene editing and crazy stuff we can do in the IVF lab. I will say that embryo donation is one aspect that is not regulated very well. There are some loose FDA guidelines, but acknowledging that when couples made these embryos, they often were not looking to give them up. They didn't create them for the purpose of donating them. There's a few points I wanna to touch on. One is that embryo donation, it, you don't get money if you donate your embryos. It is a goodwill thing. But the reason embryo donation is beautiful is that we've gotten much better at IVF. It's not perfect. And many couples have excess embryos and what they need for a family. And people feel the desire to give those embryos to another couple to help them have a dream come true. But it's a little wild, wild west out there. And I'm just being really clear. Most labs have restrictions on taking where they'll take embryos from. I mean, and there's companies, of course, who take advantage of this because they know that people don't want to dispose of embryos. Other people want embryos. And so if you're a business person, 
and there's a need and there's a want and you have a market, what are you going to do? You're going to make money off of it. And so there are places who will take embryos no matter how crappy they are. And there's other companies who do this in the middle and they try to ship to IVF labs. And I've never worked at a lab that would accept embryos like this because you can't take on however they were frozen. Can anybody in your lab freeze them? What's the quality? Often you get really bad information. So a lot of programs will have internal embryo donation options where it's your own patient. So you know the lab was good and you know the couple. But some places will take embryos from wherever. And then there's places like this that exist that they don't have to ship embryos anywhere. They are a standalone thing. They accept embryos from people and then you physically can go there. A lot of these embryo donation businesses are businesses that make money off of people. And this is a faith-based organization, which is fine. I'm not at all sitting here saying something bad about faith-based organizations, but I have a hard time when categories of people are excluded from potential parenthood options because somebody else has deemed them not worthy or acceptable. We can debate if it is a grant or free money that the people who are giving that grant away have the right to say what type of person they want it to go to. But these are people paying for a service. Nothing's being given away here. Yeah, here's a company openly discriminating and completely okay with it. You must be genetic male and female. You must be married for three years. That right away is completely discriminatory. You also have the female age has to be under 45. They exclude anybody who needs a carrier or a surrogate. You actually have to be the one to carry your baby. You have to have a low BMI, some other medical things. And the other thing is you have to pass a home study from a state adoption agency, which is not, shouldn't be a requirement to have an embryo transfer. Also sure sounds like you can't be a single mom by choice and use them. These embryos, depending on how many you get, I mean, they may only have a 20 to 30% chance of success if they even survive the 50 to 75% chance of survival. Yet they are making you jump through all these hoops. It bothers me that they take your money before you can match with somebody. It bothers me that they put Caucasian embryos with Caucasian people, regardless. It bothers me that you have to be a heterosexual married couple and that they put limitations on that you can't be single, you can't use a carrier, you have to abide by what they think is an ideal family. I'm not coming down on... On this family. I think it is a medical miracle that Molly and Emma exist. I think it should give people comfort that embryos can be frozen for long durations of time and still have viability and form into beautiful, healthy children. That's all really good news. And I'm so excited that Tina and Benjamin found their way to their family using NEGC. I'm happy for them. I think though, this is showing us that this area of reproduction is not yet regulated. Just because we can do something, we should really try to do it in a more inclusive and fair way. And we should really not let companies take advantage of people by taking their money before they're even matched with donors. And we really should discourage the use of words like adoption and home study and things that are making a couple feel like they're having to get approved for the process of the ability to carry a child. Embryo donation is still overall really rare. About 1.7% of all pregnancies in the United States are born from babies from IVF. And of those, only about 5% from embryo donation. I do anticipate we see an increase of this in the coming years. We're going to see more middleman business opportunities exist. And we're going to see more clinics start taking matters into their own hands, saying they won't accept certain embryos or only utilizing their own internal or small networks of embryo banks. Very fascinating. To Tina and Benjamin, congratulations. Molly is beautiful. I'm so excited for you and for your family. And I'm so glad for the gift that embryo donation could bring to you. As always, you can follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or check out the As a Woman podcast where there is more in-depth fertility-related information. Subscribe if you like it. I appreciate all of you. Thanks.